Let's talk about Eeny Meeny Miny Magic, one of season one's most important episodes because it introduces us to the fabulous Dr. Byron Orpheus, master necromancer, and also he has a minor in women's studies, so you know, it's got that going for him. The episode starts all spooky. We see lightning striking the Venture compound, and we see the troubled sleep of every Venture family member. Rusty has a nightmare about JJ, his unborn brother still trying to kill him from within. Brock reminisces about his days in college and the accidental and his accidental killing of a fellow student. We see Doc's latest invention, the Joy Can, standing almighty in the lab. And then we cut to the boys playing a Ouija board. Stop pushing it and ask your question. I'm not pushing it. And Dean learns that he will one day find true love. Will I find true love? Which, who knows, we could still see it in the show sometime. Dean finding true love uh, as part of the movie? I'd like it. I kind of want Dean to get some redemption after uh, the season seven finale. Then we get the first shot of Dr. Byron Orpheus as he departs from the Joy Can. What was he doing in it? Who knows? But he zaps Helper with his magical blast to stop helper reporting anything to Doc. He then walks upstairs, creeping past the boys, and as they notice him and start to worry about their, the new Dracula in their house, zip, zap, the boys fall asleep on the floor. Which is a weird theme for Hank, which is a weird theme for both of the boys this episode. They both fall on the floor a couple of times. As morning rolls around in the venture compound, Dean, like the good little boy he is, cries help to Doc. Hank and I just woke up on the floor. <sighs> we were playing Ouija and a guy hypnotized. Doc, being the not so great father, tells Dean that unless he's on fire, this is not the correct way to wake him and it starts to get a little bit angry. You're standing there in flames and the only person who can put you out is me. But Dean tells Doc all about his vampire Dracula problem. <sighs> and Doc, Upset at being woken this early, sets about sorting out his boys annoying him. Hank, meanwhile, goes to the only real father figure he's had, Brock, who tries to kill him for sneaking up on him in the night. So, maybe not the healthiest of relationships. Morning, Brock. <laughs> and then we get our first meeting of the two doctors. Well, I guess only really one doctor. Okay, boy. As Rusty tells Orpheus this incredible story that De he thinks Dean's made up, but Orpheus admits to it at all. He was in their house, and he did kill their robot, for he had to save it from seeing the impossible, the power of magic. I saved your mechanical man from certain damnation, for his frail electronic eyes had gazed upon the impenetrable. He was an unwilling beholder to the impossible! Then we cut back over to Brock and Hank. Uh, Brock starting his morning workout routine, doing press-ups on the floor, while Hank starts to go for Brock's cassette collection. What's this one? Looking through all these old Led Zeppelin uh, cassettes. And Hank wants to play them all, or at least one specific one, and uh, unfortunately, Brock doesn't want to. Get through the outdoor. Can I put it on? Rather you didn't. Zeb sold out on that one. As it brings back some tragic memories for him. Hank asks if he's about ninjas or frogmen, but... Mind you, ninjas? No. Frogmen? It's the only woman he's ever loved. Molotov. Half ninja. It's a woman! The only woman I ever loved. And then Hank gets all sad that Brock snaps at him. Because you snapped at me? But because they actually have a good relationship, unlike Doc and either of his sons, 
there's a little bit of bonding that goes on. As Brock tells Hank, he's all right. You're all right, Hank. You know that? Which is probably the best bit of male-on-male fathering or bonding we've seen in the whole show's 20-year run. God, I hope the boys grow up to be better fathers than Doc. Orpheus starts to show Doc and Dean his laboratory. I don't think this lab is zoned for a fireplace. Marvelous bookcases, hidden stairways, and a burning fire. Which, of course, Doc worries is a fire hazard and could, you know, ruin his insurance. But Orpheus tells them not to worry, for they are not real flames, but illusions. The flames you see before you are no more than an illusion, or more precisely, a symbol of the flame. And Orpheus explains to Doc and Dean that he is, in fact, a master of magic. His abilities are to perceive and control the cosmos. And mine is to perceive and control the delicate arrangement of the cosmos. And then Doc tries to mock Orpheus for his PhD, but by this stage we will know that Doc doesn't really have his own, so doesn't really have a leg to stand on there, does he? They give out PhDs for that? And then we see Byron Orpheus' first real rant. But this is a lab. Right, when I file my taxes, I can call this a lab. And of course, Orpheus' first rant is over the definition of a word. Doc calls his Sanctum a laboratory to try and get a better understanding of Orpheus' work for uh, tax reasons. I mean, you and I have the same definition for laboratory, right? And Orpheus starts to get mad, as he declares Doc's workspace a place for creating abominations of science. No, sir! You define the word as a place to create abominations! I can and explain how Doc's new invention has torn the cosmos in twain. Hold back no longer. Your latest invention has cleft the magical order of the cosmos in twain! Which sounds about right for one of Doc's inventions. Let's be honest, iffy track record at best. And then we get one of my favourite season one scenes. Should I get my scuba gear? Or... Scuba? Scuba. 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 It is a funny word. Say scuba. 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 It sounds funny. Scuba. Scuba. Yeah, it does. It really is a funny word. Hank is actually onto something this episode. And we see Hank really kind of pushing out uh, his intelligence this episode. He seems like he sort of has some plans. Then Triana walks into Dean's life. Dad, where's the blow dryer? Gentlemen, this is my daughter. And in an instant, he is lovestruck. I mean, this is also probably the first girl his age he's seen, so... What can we expect? But it doesn't help that the Ouija board told him he'll find true love. And as Doc and Orpheus start to bond over their single parenting... Single parent, eh? Now I think we have some common ground to... Yeah. We see Simba, the magic cat, and, uh... Doc talks about... something... <laughs> and Doc starts to talk about using wet Q-tips to beat cats in heat. But, uh, I don't want to talk about that anymore. <laughs> Yeah, I heard if you take a Q-tip and moisten it with warm water. Oh! I tried that once, it was horrible. I... Uh, Dean asks Triana her name, because obviously he doesn't understand nicknames, because the only name, the only other names Doc's ever called him are Dawn, David, Dank, because Doc doesn't even know his own kids' names. Well, I've heard him call me Dave or Don a few times, but I don't think they're nicknames. Which seems poor. Even Jonas always managed to call him Rusty. Which I guess isn't his name. Um, Dean tells Triana all about his adventures of ghost pirates. As he sees the jolly Roger on Triana's top. Was one time, my family was held captive by pirates. Who are ghosts? And you have a jolly Roger on your blouse, so I thought... Dean might not have flirting down, but... He got with Serena, so he must figure it out eventually. But then he tells a significantly better story about Brock killing a man with a sock full of party snaps and his head exploded. Which, I don't know if it's irresponsible, but I do want to test that. 
One time, I saw him kill a guy with a sock full of party snaps. Did the guy's head get blown off? Yes, it did. Trion asks why Dean doesn't go to school, and he talks about the learning beds. The box his pop made. The hot box his pop made. Tutored in a box my pop made. It sometimes gets very hot in the box. My pop made. And he can tell Triana some of the incredible knowledge he's learnt for it. Did you know? Penguins have an organ above their eyes that converts salt water to fresh water. Learning beds. How useful. Penguins have an organ above their eyes that converts seawater into fresh water. Cut back to Brock and Hank. Brock is now fixing helper. Why would someone do that? Because why would you leave it to Rusty the scientist? He's probably not going to get it done. Or turn helper into a walking eye. Brock doesn't have faith that Hank can even find the right screwdriver as he tells him the Philip head's the one with the X on top. It has an X at the tip. But then, as if by magic, the doors of the joy can open. And from within, Hank sees... The door just opened up! Doc? But he's happy, and he's nice. And then the sweet cool of his mother, he's never met before, and Hank is hypnotized, drawn towards the joy can. All right, boys, time to eat. You heard your mother. Now let's go grab some of our yummy Rivet grilled cheese sandwiches. But Brock, being the venture bodyguard, sacrifices himself to save Hank. <laughs> Throwing Hank away from the joy can, getting ready to smash it, before he himself is lost to it, unable to destroy the joy can. And Brock sees this poor boy he killed playing football in college, and he's finally forgiven, guilt off his conscience. Don't worry, but it's okay that you killed me. It was an accident. That wasn't no fault. And then he's attacked by ninjas. Orpheus leaves his daughter Triana a message and, and in true Orpheus fashion, it's so ridiculously over the top for what could have simply been uh, a few words on a post-it note. He tears open a skull and almost seems to magically record into it, but probably a little bit of science going on. Greetings, Pumpkin. I am at Mr. Venture's lab. I assume answering machines have been invented in 2003. Uh, Dean, all left to himself, starts to think more and more about Triana, making out with his hand. What do you think that caveman will do to us? Shh. Hush, my pet. And I'm fulfilling some prom king fantasy he has, which might explain why he was so upset on prom night. And let your prom king take care of you. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That's why he might have been so upset with Triana on prom night, because this might have been a fantasy he's had for some time. Brock fights a dinosaur with a flamethrower, polar bears on motorbikes with machine guns, and he's loving it. And then Rusty starts to explain to us what is the joy cam, a machine that connects your conscious and unconscious, that giving you whatever you want, which, on a completely separate note, because it was something I've been thinking of for some time, I think this Rick stole that for Rick and Morty in that toilet episode. Bingo! The joy can. Whatever you desire most, you got it. You get, and it's amazing. I'll be honest, I would probably spend the rest of my life in a joy can if it was an option. Orpheus even tells him it's a noble quest. A noble quest. And as he starts to prepare a magical spell to cast upon this cursed machine, he trips over Hank, who has been asleep on the floor, or more likely unconscious on the floor. That has dealt it. Oh. Please tell me that was a laundry bag. Ow, that was my arm. Hey. Um, Hank tries to explain to his father what's going on, but in typical dog fashion, he is ignored and brushed away. But Dad, Brock is- No buts, mister! You have to be firm, give them an inch and they think they're a ruler! And that's when Brock sees Molotov, and the entire joy can experience makes sense. This really isn't a machine just for, uh, fighting and living in fancy lands. It's a sex machine. <laughs> 
Brock Sampson. But Hank has a plan. He runs to find his brother, who is also unconscious on the floor. Dean! Hank worries he's been taken out by the Dracula again, but it turns out it was nothing but head rush from Dean hiding his makeout session. Hypnotized by that magic man. No, I just got up too fast. And Hank explains that Brock's sucking dad's thing that makes people happy. Except it's all evil. Only Brock's sucking dad's thing that makes people happy. But it's all evil. And Dean obviously dares Hank to make any less sense. But Hank has a plan. I dare you to make less sense. Uh, and as Doc realizes that Brock is trapped in it, he starts to explain the device's intentions to Orpheus. To get on him? No, clearly the insidious cylinder beckoned to Mr. Samson. This is a masturbation chamber. This is a masturbation chamber. That's why the lock's on the inside. But why would you put the lock on the inside? Come on, think about it. That beauty was made for Hanky Panky. Because it's basically the holodeck from Star Trek, except overtly sexual. The lonely kind of Hanky Panky. So the boys put on tinfoil hats and set out as true adventurers to save their bodyguard. No, and I don't think we should be doing this in the first place. Look, Dad thinks we're just big babies. Um... <laughs> Hank does his Doc impression, which is still one of my favourite moments from season one. You guys should have separate rooms with, like, coke machines and bumper pool in them. And the boys head in, finding Scamp is alive. He had Scamp! And he's alive! Here's Scamp! And the boys head in, seeing memories of their dear dog Scamp, realising Brock can't see or hear them, so they're going to need to come up with a new plan. Uh, he can't hear us! He doesn't even know we're standing here! Orpheus uses his magical powers to try and open up the Joy-Can door. Good sir, and shield your fragile mind. By the crimson shame of Lord Barry Sinter um, Of course, it doesn't work, but he does open up every single other device in the compound, just to make Doc's life a little bit more annoying. <laughs> Dean comes up with the genius plan to put something wet on Brock's head. Obviously, the boys don't have any fluids with them, so unfortunately, it's pee time. We have to get this soaking wet! How are we gonna do that? Don't make me spell it out for you. And then it's pee time. The boys start to pee on Dean's shirt and put it around Brock's head, which seems like a risky move on their behalf. It could have very easily ended up with two more clones needing to come out of their vats. Nice rescue, boys. You saved me from the only woman I've ever loved with a hat that smells like a men's room and... Orpheus starts to communicate with the Joy-Can, using his dark magic to see what it desires. And it requires... purity. Devours purity! This leaves Orpheus confused and asks Doc, What's it made of? What the hell is this thing made out of? And we find out one of Doc's darkest secrets, that he used an orphan, well, not all of the orphan, to create the joy can. An orphan? Did you say an orphan? Yeah, a little orphan boy. It's powered by a forsaken child? Might be, kind of. I mean, I didn't use the whole thing. It's made from an orphan. Um, Rusty didn't use the whole thing, so I guess that's good for him, but at the same time, Rusty, you're supposed to be better than your father. Don't make machines using orphans. Not sure it's quite as bad as making a robot out of your dead one of your dead best friends, but it's got to be up there. Um, so, Orpheus turns to his last resort, the magic of Marco Polo. Marco! Marco! as he starts to declare Marco from outside the joy can. Brock's annoyed at the boys' plan, but he's impressed with their spirit. At least they're trying something. And Brock doesn't get angry with them like Doc does. I'm impressed with your spirit. I just wish you'd thought it out a little better. And Brock doesn't get angry with the boys like Doc would. He's reasonably understanding, and honestly, so much better a father figure in this episode than Doc is. And then Dean starts to hear it. Marco through the doors, and he responds, Polo, communication finally established. Marco! Polo! Polo! Marco! 
Orpheus is late back for his dinner with his daughter. Brock, out of frustration, has started kicking the inside of the machine, but nothing seems to be working. <sighs> is it getting loose? And that's when Triana shows up. And what saves the day? Dean's horniest. Oh, right. Dean, 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 Dean. Which may have ruined season 7, but it does save them today. As Triana's voice starts to make its way into the Joy-Can, Dean figures out what he has to do. Orpheus has already tried true love with Doc for the boys, but, uh... Well, Doc just doesn't love them that much, does he? I don't get it. The true love thing always works. I never fail with that one. We get one of my absolute go team ventures as Orpheus joins in supporting the boys. Go! Team Venture! Yes, go Team Venture! Orpheus says he'll destroy the machine. Doc tries to convince him that they should keep it for the cash so he doesn't have to up his rent, but... Let's send this machine back to hell. No, no! This baby's gonna make me a mint! Eventually decides that maybe sending the machine back to hell where, with the orphan soul is for the best. We get one of our first Hank telling it like he sees it moment, as he explains to Dean that he really does not have flirting down. Dude, move! She was all over you! You think? No. And in our after credit scene, we... And in our after credit scene, we are shown Dean in the bathroom learning how to be a good boyfriend. Dean, what the hell are you doing in there? I need to take a shower. I'm practicing being a boyfriend, Pop! Um, what do you think? I'm thinking maybe for the next one of these, moving the camera back, also recording a lot more of these a lot faster because honestly I'm watching this show so much that I think I'm going to go insane. But I got a new painting, my hair's in a ponytail, I've got outfits, I might have this look next time, I might not. Your thoughts, your thoughts in the comments.